Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope today finds you well. Uh, <laughs> I watched some of these videos over and over and again, and I, I realized that's my standard greeting. Good morning, everybody. I hope today finds you well. And so <laughs> if you watch it, you'll, I mean, I'm pretty sure you could do a compilation of, of me doing these, and it will sound pretty much just the same for however many of these videos we've been doing. Uh, but I do mean it. I mean, good morning. Um, and it is a good morning. We, we need to understand that every day the Lord gives us is a good day. That every day the Lord gives us is something that we can use to build His kingdom. Now, I'm, I'm just going to flat out say this. I, I see too many Christians, we focus on things that have no eternal consequences. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be political parties. There's not going to be a separate division for the United States. There's not going to be a separate vision for uh, ethnicity. We are going to be one church completely together in that holy city with God at our center and we will dwell with him always. And so if that is what we will have in eternity, why don't we focus on it now? And that is why we go through these Bible studies. That is why we, we go through the Gospels. That is why we examine scriptures so that we may look like the Jesus we claim to follow. Jesus was eternity-minded. If you notice, he had no place to lay his head. When people said, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere, he said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Why? Because he was moving towards that eternal kingdom. And you and I, and I'm including myself in this, I'm not just simply pointing fingers. We are so wrapped up in the real estate here and now. We're wrapped up in the tone of our skin, the political parties, the, the temporary, that we need to be aware. When Jesus spoke of those people who were so wrapped up in this life, he said, surely they have received their reward already in full. I don't want to receive my reward now. I want to build the kingdom so that as many as possible will come with me on that straight and narrow path and we will get to see Jesus together and we will hear those blessed words, well done, my good and faithful servant. But here's the problem, and this all pertains to what we're going to talk about today. We have a relationship that we built from the very beginning when we decided to rebel against God. At the very beginning, we were designed for life. We were designed to have life, to have a full and abundant life. We were designed for community with our God and with one another. And when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, the first thing that was sundered was community between man and God. And the second thing was community between man and his wife. Instead, what happened was Adam and Eve, in their disobedience, embraced death. Good morning, Carmen and Raul. It's good to see y'all. Adam and Eve embraced death, which is why we follow after our sins. We chase after our sins by saying, God made me this way. No, God didn't make me to, to uh, wander in my eyes and look at other women. He designed me to be with himself. And since he has given me a wife, that relationship that I have with my wife is a reflection of my relationship with God. We embrace death by chasing after the things of this life which are all going to pass away but what christ did on the cross was he fulfilled the covenants he fulfilled the abrahamic covenant he fulfilled the mosaic covenant and he fulfilled the davidic covenant he fulfilled it upon that cross because you and i are too aligned with death in our sinful nature but he had none he was born of the spirit Sure, into flesh. He put on flesh for us. He became in the, forms, uh, in the form, as Philippians said, a slave. But just as our disobedience embraced death, his obedience transformed it into something else. Let's take a look. Verse 44 of Luke chapter 23. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land. By the way, this actually was something that Pilate and another person had wrote about. There are documents of this being recorded in history. Darkness came over the whole land until three, because the sun's light failed. When they talked about this in the letter, they couldn't explain the celestial phenomena. There was no um, eclipse. 
they knew about them. They, they were just as sophisticated in uh, aerial phenomena as we were. But this could not be explained. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle. And Jesus called, called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. What's the significance of all that? There's a lot more we need to unpack and discuss. But think about this. Darkness covered the land. Christ had built or had, had taken the sins of our flesh upon himself by dying as a rebel on the cross. The earth mourned because its creator had passed. Some like to say the father turned his face away. Um, I don't know that. But what I do know is that in the other gospels when we hear Jesus saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually singing a hymn of praise, a psalm, Psalm 22. And if you look at Psalm 22 and read it, it describes in detail the crucifixion. David, through all those years between David and, and here, David saw what would happen. But in the end, he knew his Lord didn't forsake him. So when we're looking at all that, we need to understand that Jesus was fulfilling Scripture even to the very moment of his last breath. And when he breathed his last, that curtain in, in the, the temple split in two. What's the significance of that? Well, you see, the high priest had finally entered his place. In the temple complex, there was this one place that only once a year, after he had observed the, the certain sacrifices, the priest could enter. It's called the Holy of Holies. He was allowed to go there if he was pure enough. And there was a division between God and man. There was a place that divided the most holy place where man could not enter because of his sinfulness. And upon his death, that covenant was fulfilled. And there were, was no longer a division between God and man. What we had divided in the garden, God had repaired through his son Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews that we have such a high priest that sits at the right hand of the Father, that advocates for us day and night. It says we can go boldly before the throne of grace because of what Jesus Christ did there. He fulfilled that commitment. No longer do we have to make animal sacrifices because Jesus, the perfect and spotless lamb, examined by um, three different tribunals, the, the, the priests and the Pharisees, Pilate and Herod, sorry, not three tribunals, but one tribunal, uh, uh, had examined and found really no fault with him. Even though the, the priests made things up, they had nothing with which they could accuse him. The perfect and spotless lamb was sacrificed. He was wounded and pierced. And by his stripes, according to Isaiah 53, we were healed. We now had the privilege of because of the fulfillment of Scripture to go into the throne of grace. That doesn't mean we come in like spoiled children. The throne of grace still requires our humility, but you can come boldly and humbly. And so we need to remember that this sacrifice that Jesus gave with his own life allows us to become again what we were made to be in the beginning just as Adam and Eve's sin embraced death Jesus through obedience transformed death it allows us to come to him not go to a priest not make the sacrifice because it was finished upon that cross consider the great weight I might not get through the verses I want to today because this is so important. And many of us, we take it for granted or we don't understand it. Jesus Christ suffered and died for six and a half hours more than any other Passover lamb. Passover lamb, they just cut the throat and, and sacrificed and, and did all that stuff that they had to do. They sprinkled the blood upon the altar and everything they were supposed to do. 
that Jesus' blood was sprinkled upon the very dust by which Adam was made. Jesus' blood washed clean the sins of those who were called, who would call on his name. It says in the book of Romans, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what that means is we put our lives into submission to him as he submitted to his father, even unto death. We too need to make sure that's what we're doing. Jesus didn't call us from death to life. He didn't destroy death as we know it. He didn't repurpose death as we know it so that we can continue to live as we did. If this is what the blood of Christ wrought, then we need to live in a newness of life. We're going to continue. When the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, This man really was righteous, or this was really a son of the gods, according to the other Gospels. All the crowds that had gathered for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, went home, striking their chests. It wasn't as satisfying as they thought it would be, was it? But all who knew him, including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Do you ever stop and consider what the Lord did for you? What he did for me? How do you live your life new? How is your life different knowing the sacrifice that Jesus did gave you and I permission to go before the throne of grace. That when that veil was torn in two, there was no longer a distinction. You and I, all of the priesthood, Jesus as our high priest, we become a, a nation of priests. We all have that honor of being able to go before the Lord. Do we walk worthy of it? In the Old Testament, when Isaiah walked into the temple and he saw the glory of God, he ran out, I am going to be undone. I'm going to be destroyed because he saw the glory of God. How often do we approach the throne of grace with such reverence? God doesn't owe us a single thing just like the, the maker of, of my computer, the maker of this tablet that I'm doing this on, owes me nothing after I've already purchased the product. We owe him all things. We owe God all things. And so we need to humbly approach. Here's the next part. Verse 50. There was a good and righteous man named Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, who had not agreed with their plan and Action. He was from Arimathea, a Judean town, and was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Taking it down, he wrapped it into fine linen and placed it in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever been placed. This actually fulfilled scripture, but we're, we're not going to get into that. We also know that Nicodemus, too, helped with the burial preparation. We find that out in the Gospel of John. Why is this important? Because there were some, even among the Pharisees, who wanted to see God's kingdom, not because of their own personal pride and power, but because they desired God. Joseph did this because he desired God. Jesus' body was placed into a tomb for three days, from Thursday, sorry, from, from Friday, all the way until Sunday. Three days, according to the Jewish calendar. Because... Death itself had to be buried. The sinful flesh had to be buried. Christ would not be glorified until sin and death were conquered. And because of the curse of Adam, we've got to consider that this is the reversal of that. The curse of Adam said that Adam and Eve would be doomed to die. The reversal of the curse said that though we may die once, it will only be once. We will rise again and live in eternity with Christ. Just as Jesus rose from the dead 
It's almost a rebirth if you, if you consider it that way. Jesus had to go into the tomb, and just as we expect, just as we expect a baby to come forth, so Jesus came forth in a newness of life, the first of many. Are you still living in death? Are you still obsessed with this world and the things of this world? Are things or, or people, relationships, politics, anything that ties you to this world, are they still having a grip on you? Are you finding yourself becoming angry or upset about the things of this world? You know what should really drive us? It shouldn't be the politics. The politicians have always been the way they are from the very beginning. Mankind has tried to dominate one another from the very beginning. Look at Cain and Abel. And we focus on things like skin color and elephants and donkeys and, and nationalities and, and all sorts of things. When eternity at stake, people are dying daily without knowing who Jesus Christ is. They're going into the grave without hope. When Jesus Christ went into the grave to bring us hope. And we focus and argue over trivial things when eternity is on the line. If that doesn't break your heart, do you really know Jesus at all? Because if you, who say you're called by his name, claim him, then you'll value what he values. And Jesus wasn't about politics. He said, render under Caesar what is Caesar, but you give to the Lord what is the Lord's. And what is the Lord's? You and me. Then let us approach him in humility, repenting of our sins and walking in the newness of life because Jesus was buried and rose again so that we can be given newness in life. Let's finish this. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed along and observed the tomb and how his body was placed. Then they returned to prepare spices and perfumes and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Jesus himself from all his great labors was laid in the tomb and for him that was a Sabbath. But he was going to do something new. Though they had no hope, Jesus was not done yet. And maybe in your life you have no hope. Jesus is not done yet. So let us build the kingdom and walk in light of eternity. The things of this world, our relationships, our, our stuff, our jobs, our our, our, our bodies, they're going to give way. And we will meet God in heaven. What will he say to us when we meet him face to face? Have we received our reward now? Or are we on our way to it? Go and preach the gospel. Go and make disciples. Focus on eternity. For this world and all things of it are going to pass away. But Jesus and his word remain forever. Focus on the kingdom eternal and hear those blessed words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let us know what you think. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you soon.